Welcome to Words on Spoken the Hills podcast. We are two Southern sisters re-watching the hills and chatting about it for your entertainment. I am Susan and I'm a 30-something photographer. I'm Jen and I do not see the appeal of Jason Waller. Today we will be discussing Season 3, Episode 6, Second Chances. So let's jump right into the episode, Jim. We start out at Teen Vogue, and Lauren drops a huge bombshell when she reveals that Jason called her last night. He's back. She says that he's in rehab in Orange County. She says they haven't seen each other since we last saw on the episode when he picks up his stuff. This is shocking, Jim. And then she says that he says that he wants to meet up and catch up and Lauren's like oh I'm so afraid he's going to mess up my life and they talk about how boys have a pager when their life is going really well and all of a sudden it's like they get a page that's like okay her life is going well time to go and ruin it and Jem ain't that the truth she's not wrong it's a real thing then we head to Equinox Gym where Lauren and Audrina are working out with a super cheesy trainer, Jarrett. Oh, I liked Jarrett in this scene. He, look, Susan, Jarrett was way more cute and adult than any of the other boys in the show in the scene. Just a saying. You are the friends you hang out with, though. So let's pause that for just a little bit. Jem, do you feel like Audrina and Lauren can barely do this workout? Look. If you still look cute when the workout is over, you didn't do the workout right. So I will take that as a yes. They're just kind of hanging out, you know, just hanging out at the gym, trying to do some push-ups, failing. But you know what? They showed up, they tried, and that is more than I did today. (laughs) So I'm going to give them this one. That is true. Same with me. So Jared suggests they go on a double date with his friend Derek that night. And Lauren casually mentions, oh, I actually met Derek last night. So that was quite a coincidence. (laughs) It's just amazing how these things happen. So Jared says they're going to do shots that night. And Audrina's like, oh, my God, you're a trainer. You shouldn't be saying that. And they're all giggling. And I'm sorry, I found Jared super annoying. But I guess you liked him. So we're not on the same page, Jim. He was just more adult after having looked at Brody and Spencer and Poodle Hair Ryan and who's the other boy? Frankie? No. There's another main boy. Jason? Sure. He seemed very adult and I felt into that as a fellow adult. I appreciated it and I was like, oh, a grown up for LC. This is great. So the girls are outside the gym recovering from their hard workout and um, they start talking about how Jason wants to get together and Audrina's like, hmm. And then she asks about Justin and Audrina reveals she's not talking to him, even though he is calling her. So she is actually like playing a little hard to get good for her or is she, but you can tell it bothers her that she's not talking to Justin. Um, She wants to go out that night. And forget the Jays, Justin and Jason. Keep trying to convince yourself, girls, only new boys. Keep telling yourself, like, oh, Justin Bobby. That was the other boy that I was trying to remember. <laughs> okay, Jim, it's time for us to give up our podcasting crown. We're done. You can't, we can't remember Justin Bobby. It's time to pack it up and go home. Thank you for joining us for Words on Spoken, the Hills podcast. This has been Jim and Susan signing off. It's been a great journey, you guys. Thanks for the memories, or lack thereof, and bye. So then we head to Bolt House, and Elodie tells Heidi there is a new job opening for event director at Bolt House, and Elodie's super excited for this job. She's just dying for her own office, Jim. So for a minute, I thought you said Ed Bolt House, and I got really excited because I was like, there's another Bolt House, and his name is Ed? How dare you, Jim? There's only one Brent Bolt house. Only one. When Heidi and Elodie are discussing the job opening, Heidi literally interrupts every single word Elodie speaks. It is the most awkward and rude conversation ever. 
I'm sure that they threw the girls in the room and like made them talk about it. But Heidi interrupts her constantly and it is horrible. Heidi is the most self-absorbed person, obviously in this episode, probably more than many others. It's just so awkward. And when they're kind of squabbling over the amount of time they've each worked there, I pretty much ran out of the room, ran out of my house, ran down the street, ran out of town into another state, into another state, and into the Atlantic Ocean, where I'm now bobbing on a raft waiting to be rescued. Will you come get me? It's really <laughs> hot. Yeah, this is the most awkward conversation. I was cringing the whole time I was watching. I was like, oh my God, no, this is too awkward. Heidi is encouraging Elodie to go for it. Talk to Brent. Go for the job before they start arguing about how long each one of them has been there, which it's just really funny. She's like, I didn't know you've been here almost as long as me. And Ellie's like, yeah, a year longer. And you can tell she's just so annoyed with her. And Ellie makes sure to mention she's worked really hard. And at that point, all I could think about was all of the times we've seen Heidi at work and all the times we've seen Ellie at work and knowing what happens at the end of the episode. It's so awkward because we all know Heidi doesn't do anything. And it's just so ugh, cringy. Heidi is eyeing that office like it's a giant piece of meat. Yeah, it's it's really tough. And those were definitely the days before girls, whether, you know, whether they do it performatively or not, supported each other a little bit more in the workplace. It was back when, you know, women were, were still being taught to work against each other to get ahead. And, you know, I'd like to think now we're living in a little bit more evolved time when it comes to that. And Heidi probably thought she would be praised for snatching that job out of Elodie's hands. Whereas, you know, in modern times, that would just be considered so inappropriate. And she probably was praised at the time for it. Oh, look at her going after what she wants, which of course is true. You should go after what you want, but obviously she was not qualified for it. It just makes me think of what happened with um, Whitney and Lauren when that job came up at Vogue. Now, I think one of the main reasons that Lauren didn't go for it is because she was still in school, but still how gracious she was that now Whitney's the boss and everything is just a tale of two women. So I found that interesting. So then we head to Spidey's apartment and Heidi comes in and tells Spencer, she has really great news and she tells him about the job and Spencer says, very legit. <laughs> this is also one of those scenes where they, Show the little Chiron as Spencer being Heidi's boyfriend. And I think we ran into this a couple of episodes ago. Aren't they engaged? They're most definitely engaged. I mean, she's wearing that big rock. So I don't know why they haven't put fiance. It just makes you wonder if it was like, oh, well, they weren't really engaged. <laughs> I don't know. It's just weird. I, I don't understand it at all. But once again, Spencer's sitting on the couch on his computer. Like, what is he doing? Looking at his press clippings? Probably Googling himself or whatever one did back then. Looking at Lexus Nexus or Netscape Navigator. I don't remember what we did back then. Lexus Nexus is like the law <laughs> software. Um, but Spencer says you should do whatever you have to to get the position, which is probably why she went after it like that was probably based on his influence. I'm sure he was egging her along because he's probably like, you can get a raise and a better position and then I can sit on the couch more. Win win. I just want to know what he's doing for work. I really do. But I think it's just the tabloid money that they're getting. So here's the question. If they are getting this tabloid money, that probably means that whole job thing wasn't necessarily real. You know, we have these revelations about Brody and Lauren and what really happened. I actually would love to know what really happened with that job. Like, was it a real job or did they kind of like fudge it? And she just kind of got a title because she was on the show. Cause we all know she's probably not working very hard. Like every time they show her at work, what is she actually doing? I'm sure it was some sort of mutual publicity thing that they did. And she probably just went to all the parties and everything as like a celebrity. And that was her job. But cause if she's making like millions of dollars, like they said, they were making on the tabloids working at an event management company, you know, for, $30,000, $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year is not that big a deal. She's not going to work hard. So I would just love to know the real story of that, Jim. 
people don't forget that Spencer and Heidi's main source of income was uh, the Hills. I thought it was more the tabloid photos that came from their popularity over the Hills. I didn't even think about the fact that they were getting paid to be on there. So yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's some kind of agreement, but I would love to know the inside story of that. I just don't think, you know, Spencer and Heidi are as open about that stuff as Lauren is. And that's why we don't know that, but maybe one day we will. So then we head to Lola's for this fun double date and we get to meet Derek. Jim, did you think Derek looked like a child? Yes, but I was more interested in the conversation they were having when the girls walked up. (laughs) That was funny. I'm so glad they got that on video. They were talking about dudes that have their head shaved with just a tail in the back. And one of the guys were like, that's a mullet. And I... Hold on. Don't say one of the guys. It was Derek who didn't know that was a mullet, which immediately establishes him as the less intelligent person between (laughs) him and Derek. It kind of sets the scene. (laughs) It tells you everything you need to know about Derek. And we know then and there that there is no hope for this man. I laughed really hard, though, on that mullet thing. It was really funny. But did you notice that Jared said, how are you, baby, to Audrina? No, I didn't. Um, You technically work for her. Please don't call her baby. I thought that was gross. But anyway, Lauren is immediately not impressed by Derek. I mean, she is like, and she's so funny. I think she makes really snap judgments about men. and. And she kind of shuts down when she's like, um, no. She hates him so much from the jump. That thrift store conversation was so funny. I was like very mundane and everything, but I was dying laughing. And I'm sure he was just like so nervous to be on TV. There's cameras all around him. He's probably never done anything like this before. He's talking to someone who's famous. I think he just probably is a really, you know, ordinary, normal guy, but he just got tongue tied. And I could almost see the panic in his eyes as he was talking, like, what am I saying? What am I saying? It was so funny, though. Do you mean Derek's thrifting manifesto? (laughs) I mean, it was such a boring conversation. I could just see in Lauren's eyes that she's like, I want to get up right now and walk away. This is a nightmare. I was reading this book a couple of days ago where someone's dating for the first time on like a Tinder and she meets someone. And they're talking and she's just like, I I can't stand this. This is the most boring thing ever. And she's like, just stands up and says, I've got to go. And the guy's like, you got to go. And she's like, yes, I can't stand any more of this. And just walks out. I'm like, that's really what Lauren should have done. She should have. And it would have been funny. So then they all head to Le Doux after dinner. And by this time, Derek has had quite a few beverages, I believe. What do you think, Jim? Oh, I mean, I'm sure he was so nervous. He was just like pounding them. He tells Lauren he likes her more than anyone he has ever met. Oh, no. Damn. And all the red flags come flying down from the Ledoux ceiling. Yikes, dude. In my notes, it says, oh, bless his little heart. <laughs> bless it. He says he can't stop thinking about her. Now we know that he has met her, what, one time. This is the second time they've met each other, but he cannot stop thinking about her. Dude has no chill. I'm so embarrassed for him. But when he says, I can't stop thinking about you in a non-psychotic way, (laughs) that's the best expression. It's so funny. But then doesn't he say something about being a murderer? Yes. (laughs) He says, well, maybe I am psychotic and have murdered people. (laughs) And that's when her eyes go big. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, he's just nervous. But it's just so funny. It's like a nightmare date. It really is. In her head, she's probably thinking, okay, give me Jason. It's really, that's so funny, though. I just could not stop laughing. It was just like, oh, dude, you've gone too far. And then he reveals that he dated a girl for seven years. And so that makes more sense. He's obviously out of practice. You date someone for seven years when you're a child. I mean, good grief. It's probably like his only girlfriend he's ever dated. And what, he's from New Jersey. So they probably dated and then he came out to L.A. and they broke up. And he's probably still getting over her. And I can see the whole thing. And he's just nervous because he doesn't know how to talk to women anymore. Throwing the cameras and all that. I forget it. And then he goes on a date with, like, literally the coolest girl in Hollywood at the time. Lauren accuses him of having girlfriend issues because she said, I only dated my ex-boyfriend for a year, and I have lots of baggage from that. And it's funny because he doesn't automatically be like, oh, red flag. He's just like, 
oh, well, why is she saying, no, no, I don't have any, but he's really not listening to her, you know what I mean? No. Nope. Um, Karina's like, let's go to the bathroom. Let's escape <laughs> to our safe place. She can probably just tell by looking at Lauren's face or if she's overhearing the conversation that she needs to get out of there. And while she's gone, <sighs> oh, bless oh, Derek. <laughs> Derek, Derek, Derek. He tells Jared, is it too early to propose? He <laughs> thinks it's going well. Bless I'm, his heart. I'm back in the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> on my raft afloat. So, of course, the girls in the bathroom are like, ah! This is terrible. Lauren is like, absolutely not. I have never wanted to stab myself in the eye more. You know what's so funny though? I was also thinking at this time, I'm like, I wonder if Derek's was the Jersey Shore going on at the same time or did it come later? Jersey Shore came after the hills. Well, I wondered if he was auditioning for the Jersey Shore <laughs> that was coming up. He was not nearly Jersey enough though. He but it made me laugh because I was really wondering if the two intersected and maybe like. He just wanted to be on a reality show. But they go back to the table and the girls sit together and Derek pouts and sticks his tongue out at Lauren. <laughs> Dude. You don't like me. You don't like me. You oh don't want me to. It's so awkward. You don't want me to murder you. Bless his heart. So then we end up at Teen Vogue. And did you notice how cute Lauren's skirt was? Yes. And she had like the belt up like at her rib cage. Like I used to wear that look all the time. Yeah, that was so awesome. And this is where it reminded me that Whitney was Lauren's boss. I had actually forgotten that in the last episode. <laughs> and um, this is also where we learned that Lauren still is in school because she's just come from school. And then Lauren prepares to just bash Derek, bless his heart. And Whitney says, yeah, guys shouldn't be so desperate. It is nice to hear guys being talked about as desperate ones, because normally that's a very cliche thing that people say women are so desperate. And over my lifetime, I have found that there is just as many guys who are desperate for like relationships and marriage as there are women. And I think that's something that's often attributed to only women. But I have known lots of guys who are like desperate to be married and be in a relationship. I think it's just a human thing and there's nothing wrong with it from either a man or a woman. I just thought that was interesting. Lauren reveals she hasn't been out on a second date since Jason. She is so obsessed with Jason. Let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, we've seen Jason for a long time because he was in Laguna Beach. He dated Jessica before he dated Lauren. And then we had all of the drama between the three of them. And then we had him come over to the hills. So we've seen a lot of them. I feel like we know Jason pretty well from his time on the reality show, even though he is a little more um, buttoned up and he doesn't talk about his feelings a lot. And he could be super awkward on camera. I feel like we do know him and he is a dud. Now, Agreed. Now, of course, we do understand that he was under the influence of alcohol and drugs most of the time. So I suppose we can give him a little bit of a understanding on that because obviously he's an addict. He's been very open about it. The work he's doing now is really great. But of course, we're back into this time of the hills. And basically, I would say what it's been less than a year since they broke up. Have we is that confirmed I think so. And I have a little theory about her feelings about Jason slash their relationship. And I think it really comes out in the final scene of the episode. So I'll save my theory for then. Okay, that sounds good. So let's move on to Bolt House. Brent calls Heidi into his office saying, I know you wanted to talk. And Elodie looks up so suspiciously. She's like, you can just see her heart sinking. And she's like, uh, what's she doing? And then Heidi proceeds to pitch herself quite terribly for the job. She basically just says, I heard about it and I want it. And I'm wearing a Burberry polo shirt and pants that are literally falling off when I walk. I noticed that too. I forgot. I mean, I know that was of the time, but I'm like, oh, why did we wear this kind of stuff? They look terrible. They really do look like they're falling off. But she basically, like you said, just kind of says, I heard about it and I want it. And then she kind of, he's just looking at her and I think she's like, I guess that's not enough. So she said, I work really hard and I'm up for the task. And I'm thinking, this is the worst pitching of yourself. What in the world? And it's like, oh, it's because she just thinks she's going to get it, which was probably the case. But still, I'm like, oh, my God. 
And then Brent says, well, you know, it's a much bigger position than you have now. It's more responsibility. This is an interesting idea. Let me think on it. And he says like, oh, it's a team decision. So I have to get with other people. And so you can tell she's just like, oh, okay. Well, I thought you'd give it to me right now. I think Heidi just doesn't know how these things work. And they probably don't work like they do in the regular real world because we all know that L.A. is different and probably like that event management scene is just completely different. And you really would get hired for something just because you were a star on an MTV show if this was even a real position. But anyway, I can't imagine what it would have been like if Heidi had had to go back to like a regular life after this happened and had to get like a regular job. I know it doesn't seem like either one of them ever did that, even though, you know, they don't seem to have much money and stuff like that. But it's just interesting to me. It's such a false view of how the world works. Just thinking about Bolt House and Heidi talking to each other. Have you ever seen a more like two dead behind the eyes people talking to each other? <laughs> no, you're right. Neither one of them have a personality, especially in this scene. It's like, oh my gosh. So next we head to the Hillside Villas and Audrina says that Jared has said they need to go to the gym because they have been slacking. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, awkward. And then the doorbell rings and it's low. And she immediately starts in on Andrina. It was like, I heard you got in a fight with Justin Bobby. Lowe's bitchiness can't help but show every time she's around Audrina. I think she's really trying to get in the way of Lauren and Audrina's relationship because she's kind of jealous of it. And I do notice in these scenes that she's wearing something that looks like an engagement ring on her left hand finger. And wasn't she engaged for a hot minute? what I'm pretty sure she was and I think her engagement was broken later but I think that's why she's just in and out really quick because she has like a whole other life of course so she just occasionally pops in but I'm pretty sure that that's an engagement ring she's wearing but anyway Audrina says she's been friendly to Justin Bobby but that's it only friendliness Jim Mm -hmm. I knew friendly with Justin Bobby too (laughs) Then Jason calls Lauren and Lo can't help but be a little snarky with her too. And she's like, is that your daddy? She knows exactly who it is, Jim. Her loud commentary in the background of all of this is like so annoying. Stop. And it's so rude. Like, why is she so mean to everybody about their men? I guess it's just her shtick. I guess so. I mean, of course they aren't great winners. So anyone who's friends with Probably would be like that. They're not wonderful men or anything, but it's like, back (laughs) off a little bit, low. Good grief. And do you notice, like, as Lauren is talking to Jason, like, they're kind of already, like, fighting on the phone. They, It seems like it's a tense conversation. I'm like, well, that didn't take long to get back to that place. And then she gets off the phone and she's like, I think we're good as friends. (laughs) And then we have this really enjoyable part where they start reading from a love and sex book. And what do you want to bet the producers bought this and was like, read sections of this out to each other? Because it's just so weird. Let's get these girls going with some personality and excitement. Although I suppose we used to do that with like Cosmo magazines. You would read sections out loud or, you know, remember we have one friend who when you're at the beach, she would read out um, the stories in there aloud. Or remember when she was reading Fifty Shades of Grey and she was like, Let's read this aloud. And she'd read it out loud to us. It was so funny. So I guess that does really happen. Yeah. But I think the important thing to get out of there is when Lauren reveals she has only fallen in love one time. And that's with Jason. And then she stares off into space, smirking about her one love. I have, in my notes, Lauren smirks. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think she was in love with Steven? For years. That you mean uh, I suppose uh, she didn't want to say that because they didn't really date or anything. But I feel like she was madly in love with Steven. Uh, it's just a little rewriting of history. Uh, so then we head back to the hillside villas, but now we're poolside. And Derek called Lauren and left her a message. Ooh, take a hint, sir. And they joke that he said, hello, wifey, want to get married? So <laughs> They definitely know what he was like, even though they didn't even hear that part about the proposal. So it's kind of funny that that was pretty accurate. Derek wants to get together. Bless his little heart. Bless (sighs) 
like, really, dude, you never should have called her back. But I guess he didn't get the hint. And then Lauren wonders if her standards are too high. And we all roll our eyes and say, no, they're not high enough. I love their uh, raspy voices in this scene from their many late nights at Ledoux. <laughs> yeah, you can tell they've been going out a lot. Audrina says there's no perfect guys, which is true. But girls, you aren't perfect either. You're also not going to find your perfect man at Ledoux. <laughs> no. And then we find out that Justin has apologized to Audrina because Audrina didn't talk to him for a week. And he's never said sorry before. So this is such a great breakthrough. Justin Bobby has told Audrina he's sorry. He is doing like the absolute bare minimum that a human being can do. And and, he- and once again, we applaud a man for doing the very least. Absolutely. Justin Bobby, call me. And Audrina says, I really do think we should just be friends, which we know she doesn't mean, but it is true. Although I actually think she shouldn't even be friends with him. Obviously, she has too many feelings for him to just be friends. And then Lauren comes in with just that patented Lauren wisdom. I love when she says something that is just so insightful. It's like, yes, she's so smart about this stuff. She says, I think you want to be with him when he's the good Justin, but he can't always be the good Justin and you can't just like half of who a person is. Mm. So true, Lauren Conrad. Then we head back to Bolt House. Heidi comes wiggling into Bolt House and (laughs) heads straight for the new office. She got the job, Jim. Susan, is this like one of the more heartbreaking scenes of the Hills? Yes. This episode always makes me so upset. Not taking into account what was probably really going on behind the scenes, because I know we're not supposed to do it, and we've probably done it too much in this episode. Just going off of strictly what's on the screen, this is such a horrible thing she did to Elodie, who has been nothing but nice to her, listened to her for hours talk about her boy problems and her drama with Lauren. She's always been there. She's always been supportive. She's helped her out at work. For her to swoop in and take this job from her is so upsetting to me. And you know how much I love Elodie, too. I really like her. She's such a good, you know, character on the show. She seems like a really good person. And it's just, it's so upsetting. She, you know, she all actually works really hard. And so just to see Heidi swoop this job away from her, it makes me really angry, actually. So I think that this is a good time to reveal to our listeners um, that we almost had Elodie on the show. And then she chose to not come on with us because it was really making her relive some painful moments. And we were very respectful of that and totally understanding, of course. Um, I just can't imagine a normal, great human being like Elodie um, with a good heart, you know, trying to make it in L.A. and coming in contact with someone like Heidi Montag, who was, you know, there for the fame and fortune and MTV And, um, you know, having to go through that and probably not being privy to maybe everything that was going on behind the scenes. And I'm assuming Elodie and Heidi haven't talked about this publicly. You know, I just wonder if there's more details out there. Do you know? No, like I said earlier, I would love to know the true story, but I don't know. I didn't try really try to do a deep dive and figure it out, but... We're probably the only one who's interested in the real story of that. But yeah, I have to say when Elodie told us that she decided she didn't want to do it, it did make me almost respect her a little bit more. And she has a normal life and, you know, getting into that again, you know, it it probably was real life for her. It's probably not so much real life for the main stars other than the fact that people think it's their real life and so it can get kind of messy because of that but I imagine being on the outskirts of a show like that but also having a pretty large part in it that has to be kind of weird I'm sure. Heidi probably forgot that happened six months after the show aired and someone like Elodie was traumatized for years I can imagine I mean I think you and I have both been in traumatic work situations that happened a long time ago and still affect us to this day. And I have a ton of respect for Elodie and definitely a lot of empathy for her. So, yeah, this is just such an awkward scene, but Elodie is so gracious. She says, congratulations. I cannot imagine doing that in that situation. I would like want to just burst into tears and cry. 
She said, good for you. I'm glad. Oh my gosh, my heart breaks. Heidi knows she did something bad. Like you can tell she does feel a little bad about it because it's just so awkward. But I think she just kind of wants LED to go away so she can like be excited about it and not have to worry about her feelings. LED says no hard feelings, but it's just really sad. But Jem, I just have to say, you know, if you think about all the conversations that Heidi and Elodie have had and what a support she's been through her with her, you know, horrible boyfriend and losing her best friend. And Heidi just keeps pushing people away. She's going to end up with really only Spencer because she has no one else. I mean, look at what she did to her family a couple of episodes ago. Yep. Like tried to separate her from her family. He's already separated her from Lauren. And now with his encouragement, she's kind of screwed over Elodie. So it's like, girl, that is like the number one thing you don't do. You don't throw over everybody for a guy. There's something wrong with your relationship. If you're like throwing everything away for a guy, but also they're still together now. So what do we know? Hashtag team Elodie. So then we head to the beach and we see Justin and Audrina leaving the beach and getting on the motorcycle and driving down the road. I guess this is what friends do, Jim. It's a tale as old as time. Then we see Lauren in her convertible and she's going to meet Jason. Ooh, another familiar scene. Can we talk about how beautiful Lauren looks, though? She's so I- classically beautiful. Iconic in the polka dot scarf headband. And Jason actually looks pretty good. He looks much healthier than the last time we saw him. He's been in rehab and his hair has been cut, which Lauren notices and talks about. She gives him back his sunglasses that she found in his car. And it's a little awkward. He talks about how he's already been to his morning group. And it's so weird that he and Lauren stopped talking, which is weird because I don't think it's (laughs) weird at all because they broke up, Jason. And Lauren just basically said, hey, I needed a clean break. I couldn't talk to you. And I feel like there was so much that was going on said because, you know, when they're on the MTV, they're so careful about what they say. Like they really so briefly like mentioned he was in rehab. And they were always very careful about how they talked about things where it wouldn't get too serious. I guess they didn't want to make a very special episode type of thing. But they're very careful about what they say. But, you know, he clearly says, hey, I've been to morning group. And I think in the last episode is when Lauren says, yeah, he's been in rehab. But, yeah, Jason admits to being that he was out of control and he had bad habits. And, you know, they didn't really address that very much before they broke up. It was kind of. They edited that scene out. And once you watched like the special and she was actually pretty honest about what was wrong with the relationship, then they were just in a horribly toxic relationship. And this just whole scene made me wish she hadn't even gone to meet him. I feel like it probably stirred up some really bad feelings for her. And don't you feel like Jason is like hinting around that they want that he wants to get back together? Yeah, it just seemed like they went to such a codependent place in this meeting. She was shaking her head at him and being so motherly and condescending. Like, she was so disappointed in him with her body language. And he was so meek and, like, he was her child. And he was feeling her disappointment in him. It was not healthy. Nothing about that moment was healthy. And if that was showing progress with them, then it just didn't, it didn't look good to me at all. No, me either. It made me really sad. And I think if Lauren hadn't been strong enough, she could have easily fallen back into that trap. Now, of course, in the next few episodes, we'll see how that shakes out. And she does seem to be maybe weakening. But I was glad in this episode, it seemed like she wasn't having it because I think all she would have had to do was encourage him a little bit. And that would have been it. Now, of course, we know what's coming up soon. But It just seems like he really wants to get back together. But it must be so hard to be on this show and question people's motives because maybe he just wants that sweet, sweet Hills money now that he's out of rehab. So I would kind of think in my head, why is he doing this? And we will talk about this soon in other episodes where we talk more about his motives. But I was a little like, "Mm mm-hmm. It didn't take you long to try to jump back into her life. Does this episode of The Hills pass the Bechdel test? Okay, Jim. Does this episode of The Hills pass the Bechdel test? 
It sure did, but in the absolute worst way. Why don't you go over what the um, qualifications are for the Bechdel test? The history of the Bechdel test is amazing. Some of you Broadway fans might know Fun Home and the name Allison Bechdel. Well, she drew a cartoon about a test that you can use to apply to movies. And we like to apply it to every episode of The Hills. So first question for you from the Bechdel test. Were there two named characters that are female in this episode? Yes. And did those two women speak to one another? Yes. And when those two women spoke to one another, did they talk about anything that did not have something to do with the man? The scene that did pass the test, Susan, was Elodie and Heidi talking about Heidi getting the job. Oh, you're right. And about them talking about the job. Yep. And so by Heidi screwing over Elodie and stealing the job away from her and one woman ruining another woman's life, the Bechdel test was passed. But you know what? Women's lives are complicated and women's stories are complicated and movies and TV shows about women should show complicated storylines about women. So it's okay. It's still passed the test. You're right. I agree. Winners of the week. Okay, Jim, who was your winner of the week? My winner of the week was Jared the trainer because his hotness was on display. He had no embarrassing moments like his friend Derek, and he probably went on to date every hot girl in Hollywood as well as train the not hot ones. Jem, my winner of the week is Justin Bobby because he managed to manipulate Audrina into hanging out with him again and apologizing to her. I'm using air quotes for apologizing. And he managed to worm his way back into Audrina's affections without being her boyfriend. Oh, you mean Audrina's best friend, Justin Bobby? Jim and Susan's funniest moments. All right, Jim, I'm sure we have the funniest moment, the same one this week, but you go ahead and tell me yours first. No, I don't think we do. Um, My funniest moment was a slash nostalgic moment slash kind of sad. (laughs) Um, It was just when, you know, all the stuff was going down with poor Derek, the... um, What's his name? The threadbare. <laughs> what was he called? The um, thrifting. The thrifting boy. Um, when all that was going down and the girls ran away to the bathroom, it was just really funny because that is something you can do when you're on a double date and things are going wrong is you can run away to the bathroom and tell your friend that you want to stab yourself in the eye because you're on such a bad date. So that was the funniest part of the show to me, but also kind of sucks that you have to go like run away from men in the bathroom that you can't just look them in the eye and tell them. That they're boring and you want to leave. Well, you are incorrect because we both did have the same funniest moment. It was Derek. That's all I wrote, Derek. <laughs> Everything about Derek was hilarious. <laughs> this shirt was 40 cents. <laughs> there are some people in LA that are... There are some people in LA that are... There are some people in LA that are... All right, Jim, what was your pratfall of the week? My biggest pratfall was Spencer's attitude of just basically being like, my wife is, my wife is totally qualified for this job she's telling me about that I know absolutely nothing about. He's just like super competitive on her behalf. My biggest pratfall was, of course, him just sitting on the couch again. We should have started, like, counting how many episodes the only thing he does is sit on the couch. Did he ever leave the couch? Was he sick? Did he lose the use of his legs temporarily or something? No, we've missed so many opportunities to count this. I know, and we love counting things. We love counting and recording things and giving them names. We could call it, like, Spencer Couch Couchsters. Well, Jim, it's time for us to end the podcast on that high note. It's been really great recording the Hills podcast with you, Susan, but this will be our last episode. Goodbye, y'all. Well, I actually just meant this episode and not the whole podcast because we actually did that bit last time. So, uh, you know, we're just, you can't recycle the bits every time, Jim. And we'll do it again. Thanks for joining us for Words Unspoken, the Hills podcast. Here's the way to get the scoop on how to get in touch with us. 
You can email us anytime at wordsunspokenpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on our website, wordsunspokenpodcast.com. Here's all the ways to find us on social media. You can like our Facebook page, Words Unspoken, The Hills Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at The Hills Podcast and follow us on Twitter at The Hills Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. You and all your pretty little friends Up in the hills where the party never ends Your schemes and your dreams when you're whole and you're broken I'm telling